Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about a topic that's come up uh, a couple of times uh, in the previous contributions, and that's the question of international debt uh, that Grace just alluded to as well, um, which I really think is one of the most important challenges that we face today uh, when it comes to South-North relations. Um, I want to start, since we're being co-hosted here by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, uh, with an observation from Rosa Luxemburg herself. And actually, she was one of the first ones to observe the fundamental paradox at the heart of the international debt regime. Um, she noted that foreign loans are indispensable for the emancipation of the rising capitalist states, yet there are also the surest ties by which the old capitalist states maintain their influence and continue to extract wealth from the young capitalist states. And she wrote this around the turn of the 20th century, at a time when Western imperialist powers were still actively dispatching gunboats um, to the global periphery to ensure that their debts will be repaid in, in full. Uh, thankfully today, such militaristic, um, such militaristic ways are no longer acceptable. Yet the international credit system remains one of the fundamental pillars, if you will, or one of the, ah, thank you, one of the most important levers through which for which wealth is redistributed from the global south to the global north. This exploitative dynamic obviously becomes all the more important in times of crisis and all the more visible in times of crisis. We saw it come to the fore very clearly in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, very visually and very uh, violently um, uh, for the people suffering the consequences of the debt crisis there. But Sri Lanka is by no means the only country to face this problem. In fact, as of last year, the UN noted that 54 countries are facing severe debt problems at the moment. I mean, 54 countries, let that sink in. Why are we not talking about this much more? Why are we not reading about this in the headlines much more? I mean, I think it was a good thing that Greece was in the headlines 10 years ago, but that was just one European country and it was all over the news. Why are 54 countries in the global south not as important as one country in the European Union? Um, I think part of that has to do with the fact that, unfortunately, for these countries, they, their economies only constitute about 5% of the world economy. And they are not considered a systemic threat to the global financial sector. Um, at the same time, this global debt crisis, obviously, for very clear reasons, matters. It matters because the people living in these countries um, include more than half of the 650 million people who were living in extreme poverty um, in the world last year. And it matters because every single dollar spent by their governments on debt repayment is a dollar that doesn't go to investment in health, education, poverty alleviation, fighting climate change, you name it. So according to UNCTAD, 3.3 billion people currently live in countries that spend more on debt repayments. 3.3 billion people spend more, uh, live in countries that spend more on debt repayments than on health and education. But obviously the result of that is a vast transfer of resources from the global south to the global north, and a perpetuation of poverty and inequality in the countries of the south. This becomes even more apparent in like the climate crisis. Many of these countries that we're mentioning are actually at the forefront of some of the most severe impacts of the climate crisis, yet their countries are only able to spend about 20% um, on fighting climate change uh, compared to what they spend on debt relief. So obviously it, it's clear that debt relief should be at the heart of the south northern island. And it should be at the heart of what we're talking about when we're talking about the construction of a new international economic order. Uh, it is essential to development, it is essential to poverty uh, reduction, and it is essential to fighting climate change. But here, as Grace mentioned, we run into a fundamental power dynamic, a power asymmetry at the heart of the world economy. Um, and that power dynamic is crucial to determining who pays for the crisis. Obviously, if you're talking about 54 countries, facing severe debt problems, you're talking about a structural crisis. I mean, this problem didn't just occur because 54 countries woke up one day and started completely mismanaging their economies and found themselves in a huge hole. No, this is a structural crisis that demands solutions at the level of the global financial system, that demands solutions at the level of the international debt architecture. Yet the creditor countries have been abusing their power position for decades now. And we're talking for four, five decades. You can go back much further if you want to the imperialist era. Um, but at least in the neoliberal era, we've been seeing this ever since the crisis of the 80s. That they've been abusing their power position in order to prevent those type of systemic solutions uh, from being pursued. Instead, what they do is they pursue individual, case-by-case -case responses. And that's really at the heart of the current management of international debt. It's to try to isolate, divide, and conquer 
the developing countries and deal with it on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, I want to skip over some stuff just to get to the conclusion. Um, because obviously if you're in this position as a developing country, as a data country, if you're isolated against a united front of creditors, you're going to find yourself at a huge power imbalance. It's going to be much more difficult to demand debt relief, and we see that, for instance, in the case of Zambia, which took three years since its default at the height of the coronavirus pandemic to restructure its debts and to obtain debt relief. We could go on with many more examples of countries that are in a similar position. It is for this reason that in the 1980s, the revolutionary leader, Burkina Faso, uh, Thomas Sankara, called for a united front against the debt. He did that because he realized that it's absolutely crucial that the countries of the global side felt unite their forces and present a unified front in their negotiations with the creditors. Um, I think that that's a wonderful vision to go back to, and it's that South-South dialogue um, that I think is very inspiring for all of us. And those of us in the Global North, I think, have a special responsibility there to learn, to listen, and um, to join in comradeship, in humble comradeship, in order to fight for a new international financial architecture in which debt relief is a fundamental principle that will be starting. Thank you very much.